This video has two topics. I want to talk about linguistic shape and also about one method of analysis that we call a substitution test. The way your book uses the word shape, it's a technical term from linguistics. The meaning of it is important in chapter two in the discussion, sorry, chapter three in the discussion of verb forms. And it's going to be important several more times later in this course. So the first purpose of this video is to clarify what we mean exactly when we say the shape of a word. The second purpose has to do with how we do analysis in this course. One important technique when you're doing grammatical analysis is called the substitution test, and you're going to use it in chapter three and thereafter. So I want to clarify what substitution tests are and what you do with them, what they're good for. To first deal with linguistic shape, even if you've never used the technical term linguistic shape, you have some familiarity with the concept because you already know what a homonym is. A homonym sounds like another word that is, however, a different word, right? So tow a car, but the toe on your foot, or a pair that you eat versus a pair of socks. Those are homonyms. What we can say about those words is they have the same phonological shape. They sound the same. They have the same phonological shape. Now, look at this pair of words. Close the door. Stay close to the door. Close and close are not the same word, right? They do have the same spelling, but they don't sound the same. Moreover, one is a verb and another is an adjective. They have different meanings, et cetera, et cetera. They're different words, but they have the same orthographic shape. They're spelled the same. They have the same orthographic shape. So if we say a word has the same shape and we don't distinguish phonological or orthographic, what we mean is both. So when a word has the same shape as another word, it has the same spelling and it has the same sound. So students sometimes ask me, why don't Pullum and Huddleston just say the same spelling? They keep saying the same shape and it's not necessary to throw in that extra word. Actually, it is necessary. If you take a sentence like this, I'll read it tonight. I read it last night. Read, read, not the same word, right? And we can't just say, well, words with different spellings. They don't have different spellings. Nevertheless, they are different words. Spelling and shape do not boil down to the same thing. Spelling boils down to half of shape. It's actually not uncommon at all in English for words to have the same spelling, but not be the same word, not have the same shape phonologically. Here's an example. When are you going to graduate? When, where are you going to graduate school? It's not graduate school, right? Graduate, graduate. Here's one. Please conduct yourselves appropriately. Make sure your conduct, not conduct, right? Conduct is appropriate. And here's another one where the words are really different in meaning. They took a bow. They tied the ribbon in a bow. Same spelling, but we would not say those words have the same shape. So Pullum and Huddleston are concerned with discussing words that have different shapes, and that can be either phonologically or orthographically. And in this chapter, where they're particularly concerned with it, why it's important, is because they're talking about verbs, and they're talking about the forms of verbs, and whether or not the forms have the same shape. Now, if you don't remember the verb forms now, this is a good time for you to stop the video and go back and review. Here's the list that your book gives. Every verb of English appears in these six forms. Preterite, third singular present, plain present, plain, gerund participle, and past participle. If those don't ring a bell with you, this is the time to go back and look at the chart in your book and look at the examples that you're given so that you have some idea of what those forms mean. And then when you're ready, go on. So the issue, one of the issues in this chapter is that sometimes verb forms have the same shape. Two forms of the same verb have the same shape. Nevertheless, we're going to say that they're not the same form and you're going to see why. Okay, let's take these forms which are in fact different. They can be here. Be is the plain form. They are here. Are is the plain present form. The verb be, the plain form and the plain present form have different shapes. Be versus are. 
but this verb is exceptional in that way. For almost every verb in English, the plain form and the plain present form are identical. Actually, they have the same shape. So look at the verb go. They can go there, they go there. Go is the same as go. They have the same shape. We're going to argue that they are two different forms. You're going to see how we can tell that when we get to the methodology for telling that. Here's another example. They can find us. They find us. Find, find. Two different forms, the same shape. They can explore the possibilities. They explore the possibilities. Explore, explore, the same shape. That's the plain form and the plain present. Now let's think about the preterite form and the past participle. The case is kind of similar. Now on one hand, we do have a fair number of verbs where the preterite form and the past participle have different shapes. Here's an example. Barbara Walters did the same thing. Barbara Walters has done the same thing. Did and done different shapes, right? Did is a preterite. Done is a past participle. Went is a preterite. Gone is a past participle. Sang, sung, took, taken. These are examples where the preterite and the past participle have different shapes, but we have a lot more verbs in English where the preterite and the past participle have exactly the same shape. The other ones we call somewhat irregular, right? The regular verbs. The preterite and the past participle mostly have the same shape. Here's an example. I received your foolish and impotent letter, preterite. It's not an issue that has received much attention, past participle, but they look the same. They have the same shape, received and received. So when we see a verb form used in a clause, we can't always tell by the shape what its form is. It might be a preterite or a past participle, and we can't tell by the shape. It might be a plain form or a plain present form, and we can't tell by the shape, always. So one kind of analysis that you're asked to do in Chapter 3 is to determine which form it is and then to demonstrate that. The methodology you use for this kind of analysis is one that you're going to use for a lot more analyses in this class. It's called a substitution test. It's a real common um, method of grammatical analysis. For a substitution test, the principle is that you change something in the clause so that the form or the structure of the clause becomes more apparent. The form of a word or the structure of the clause becomes obvious if you change the key thing. So suppose you're, at, you're asked to look at these sentences. The letters that were received in our office were forwarded to you. Everyone who received a letter should call us. Suppose you are asked to say whether received is a preterite or a past participle. And we just noticed that they have the same shape, so that's not going to help you in this case. But they don't have the same usages. In any given clause, in any given place, only one of them is going to be grammatical. So what you need to do is find out which one is allowed in the place that received is holding in each of these sentences. In other words, what kind of form can go in these blanks? Can a preterite fit in there grammatically, or can a past participle fit in there grammatically? We should be able to tell if we substitute a verb where the forms have different shapes, right? So let's take the verb that the plain form of it is right. Try to put either the preterite or the past participle of right into each of the blanks in those sentences on your screen. In each case, only one of them makes a grammatical clause, right? Are you seeing it? Is this what you got? Remember the star means an ungrammatical sentence. The letters that were wrote in our office, bad sentence. The letters that were written in our office, good sentence. Everyone who wrote a letter, good sentence. Everyone who written a letter, bad sentence. Only one form fits into that phrase grammatically. In the first one, only the past participle fits, and in the second one, only the preterite fits. So we can say that received in the first sentence, the letters that were received, is a past participle. How do we know? Because only a past participle fits there. Received in the second sentence, everyone who received a letter is a preterite. 
Only the preterite fits there. The past participle is ungrammatical. That's the substitution test. Now let's try an analysis that distinguishes plain form from plain present form. Here were the sentences we looked at where we saw that the plain form and the plain present could be the same. They can find us, they find us. Suppose that I ask you to demonstrate which one is plain form and which one is plain present. There are actually two kinds of substitution tests you could do for this one. So first let's do one that's pretty much just like the one we did for preterite and past participle. Let's find a verb where plain and plain present have different shapes and substitute it for the verb that we're testing, which is find. In the case of the plain and the plain present, really there's pretty much just one verb that has different shapes for those. Remember the exceptional verb we talked about? Be, right? So that's the one that we're gonna use. They can be us. You may not like the semantics of that, but it's perfectly grammatical, right? They can are us, oh no. This makes no sense. This crashes syntactically. It's just not possible. They are us, grammatical. They be us, ungrammatical. So the substitution test here shows that only a plain form works in the first sentence, and only a plain present works in the second sentence. So we can conclude that find in they can find us must be a plain form. Find in they find us must be a plain present. Those are the only forms that fit in the sentence grammatically. Now the second test you could do in this case is to substitute something different, to substitute a different subject for the one that the clause has now. Now why will this work? Because the present form shows agreement with its subject. The plain present can't go with a third person singular subject. We can't say they finds in standard English. Uh, that kind of subject, a sub subject like she, he, or it, or anything that's third person singular, causes the third singular form to occur. She finds, right? So the present form has to be plain present or third singular present depending on its subject. But the plain form, on the other hand, doesn't show agreement with its subject. In this sentence, we see that find, the plain form find, can occur whether the subject is third person singular, like the student, or not. So they help the student find her classroom. They help the students find their classroom. We don't say they help the student finds, right? The plain form doesn't have to agree. So this is another property that can help us tell a plain form from a plain present form. If we go back to these sentences, they can find us, they find us, we see that the subject in both of them is plural. This is allowing ambiguity, right? It's allowing us to not be able to tell by the shape of the form which form it is. So if we change the subject to third person singular, if the verb is plain form, it should still be grammatical because the, third, the plain forms don't have to agree with their subject. But a plain present form should give us an ungrammatical sentence because the present tense forms do have to agree. So let's change it to a third person singular subject. She can find us still works okay. We don't say she can finds us. She find us does not still work okay. We have to say she finds us. So we've gotten the same results that we got from the first substitution test. In the first sentence, the plain form is grammatical. The third singular present is ungrammatical. In the second one, the plain form is ungrammatical. The third singular is grammatical. And we conclude that the form in the first sentence is a plain form, not agreeing. And the form in the second sentence is plain present, right? And remember the second sentence was they find us. The find in that one is plain present. And she finds us, of course, it's third singular present, but we can tell that by the shape. Okay, a final note about substitution tests. Sometimes because of things like licensing properties of verbs, you have to change the sentence a little bit to make the test work. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say I give you this sentence, please work quickly. 
and I asked you to figure out whether work is a plain form or a plain present, and then demonstrate that to me. And so you say, okay, I'm going to substitute a verb where the plain and the plain present have different shapes. I'm going to substitute be. And so you get this. Please are quickly. Please be quickly. Except both of them are ungrammatical. It's not helping you a whole bunch. But the problem is that the second one's ungrammatical for the wrong reason. It's not ungrammatical because it's the wrong verb form. It's ungrammatical because be needs to have a noun phrase or an adjective phrase for a complement. The adverb quickly doesn't do that function, and be doesn't live without a complement. So you give it one in order to make your test work. You say, please be back quickly, and that works fine. Where please are back quickly doesn't work at all. So you see that as long as you've satisfied the basic licensing needs of B, then you can tell the plain from the plain present. So the basic principle is if you need to change something in the clause for a reason like that, that's not really related to the test, go ahead and do that, but don't change any more than you have to. Just change what's necessary.